ladies and gentlemen, uh, before we turn to Kuma, um, let's just dwell for a moment on what we've, uh, what we've heard this evening. We, we've had a remarkable run. Roger mentioned 2001. That was Richie, I think. Um, and the names that have graced this stage in the, uh, in the period since then uh, are with the great names, the most important figures that the game's ever had. I don't think, and I don't think one should start to rate or even necessarily compare, because uh, Archbishop Tutu grabbed our attention in a very emotive way. Uh, other great players, Kumar amongst them, Martin, um, also uh, uh, crystallized their thoughts for us in a way that made them easy to understand and also interpreted the game in a way that we hadn't necessarily thought about before. But tonight we've heard something very remarkable in its openness, um, in its brutalness at times, uh, in its brilliance, and in its set of a dream. Because if I was giving a message to any young people now, I would want Brendan McCullum to come and tell them about it. Brendan, thank you. Um, please welcome to the stage a very favourite cricketer of mine, and not least uh, because he's so damn easy to interview when he's under pressure at the end of a match. Um, a beautiful, natural talent with the bat. A, a man who, who can clear bars at any cricket ground because of the imagination of his play. A natural leader. Um, Andrew Strauss has done a number of exceptional things since he came uh, into the role of leading the, the, the cricket side, of uh, being managing director of, of the England cricket team and, and all that goes with it, high performance or whatever the exact title is. But one of the things he did was appoint Owen Morgan to the captaincy of the one-day side. And Owen Morgan made seismic changes uh, of his own volition to approach and attitude. He modernised the way England play, uh, and they're going extremely well. Thank you. Owen Morgan. Um, you saw um, Mahela and Kumar batting together at Lords uh, a moment ago. I can't think. I mean, right and left-handed, there's the famous Graham Pollock-Barry Richards partnership at Kingsmead uh, in 1969-70 against the Australians. And there'll be others um, that you maybe will be able to tell me about. But I wonder if any pair of right and left-handed batsmen have so beautifully complemented each other and reached such levels of, of excellence. Uh, we've heard from Mahela before on, on, on these chairs, uh, and we've heard from Kumar before, but he's back tonight. Kumar Sangakara. <laughs> ah. And, ladies and gentlemen, Brendan McCallum. Ah, oh, boss. Please in. Go around this way. Eh? <laughs> on your own, on your own. Oh, thanks, Andy. Um, well, let's start with batting at Lords, because that is everybody's dream. We'll talk more about batting at Lords from the home point of view in a moment. But, I mean, all the things you achieve in cricket, and is that the one that means the most in terms of personal performance? Um, I, I think the 2000 and there's a magic about him, isn't there? There's a... Is that me? Might be me. Anyway. I, I think the 2014 World Cup win in the T20 format. No. How are we doing with that volume? Hello? Hello? Better? No. We might have to adjust that mic. Let's just... I don't know. We... Hello? No, we're going to need an expert, I think, on the... Oh. Um, is your mic working well? Uh, Might working well? Ye yes, no, no, yes, no. Do you know that's a first? All these years, and we, I don't ever remember a microphone problem. So you've done a great job until now, sir. <laughs> Sixteen years of well, fifteen years of brilliance. No. no try that. Hello? Yeah, better. Ah. <laughs> uh, right, batting at Lords. Batting at Lords. Uh, I think, personally, the 2014 World Cup win in Bangladesh ranks at the top because 
I've been there five times before, fifth time included that one and failed to get across the line. T20. Uh, T20 yeah, and, not and, when and you say 50 welcome. over as well. So we've been in two 50 over finals, two T20 finals before and not got over the line. So to get over the line in Bangladesh was, um, you know, you kind of, it's kind of a vindication of sorts of yourself as a cricketer and, and, and your team and, and what they've struggled through and, and achieved. Um, but coming to Lords, knowing it's my last tour, um, and leading up to Lords, everyone's been asking me, "Are you going to get a hundred at Lords? Are you going to get a hundred at Lords?" And I knew I wanted to get a hundred at Lords, and then I, <laughs> I, I actually started then to say, "Okay, just don't jinx it." And I said, "Oh well, if it happens, it happens. But then if it doesn't, it doesn't." I kind of a very philosophical view in interview, but inside I was like, "Yes, I really want this hundred." Um, and it's one of those really strange days of batting. And it's about the second time I've ever batted in my life and not put a foot wrong. Um, I think I had one inside edge of James Anderson, but everything else just, just happened, um, like an autopilot. Um, I remember once against the West Indies, I had failed in two innings, in three innings, in Sri Lanka and the fourth inning. I remember my wife uh, was talking about something and she said, oh, you've got a game tomorrow. Well, I hope you get some runs. And I just, I remember telling her, oh, I'm, I'm definitely going to get 100 because I just know. And I did. And the funny thing at Lords was walking out to Lords. I was in the balcony thinking, you know, after all this build up, my final innings, my final test at Lords, imagine what would happen if I get out for a duck. <laughs> what would happen if I walk out there through the long room all the way out there wishing so badly that I needed a hundred and I got our first ball. And I actually laughed to myself in the dressing room thinking, oh, wouldn't that be ironic? Wouldn't that be so funny? Um, and having walked out there, crossed the line, for some reason there was a lot of clarity in the sense that I was there to, to score runs for the side. If I get to a hundred, great, but I'm just gonna enjoy that, that moment, much like what, what Brendan said in his, in his amazing um, lecture a few minutes ago. So, yes, it ranks right up there with, with the many, best times I've had. How many hundreds have you made at Lord? <laughs> Single figures, definitely. Single figures. But I have never walked down. I still don't come down them stairs and think I'm going to score 100. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think cool, the same to say there's a lot of us that don't. <laughs> have you ever had that feeling? You think, I'm going to score 100? Well, I was actually just thinking... Um, because I actually had that same ambition of getting 100 at Lords in my final winnings when I got out first ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think I jinxed it for you. <laughs> did, did you, did, I mean, it, it, actually, I don't know the life, the boyhood ambition thing. I'm not so sure. That's, it, it, is, it is a valuable thing to do, but not necessarily a lifetime ambition, because there's a big world out there. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, I think everyone's different, and again, like you don't want to be, you don't want to judge other people who are statistically minded or, or driven in that way. But for me, it was not about that. It was about trying to have a good time with your teammates, and you hope to be winning games, um, you hope to do well. But ultimately, it's um, it was always yeah, just a game. And there's a bigger. Yeah, but everyone's different, and you've, I guess you've got to be respectful of that. To bring a team together, you've got to understand what motivates different people to be able to uh, to be able to get them to perform at their best and. We were lucky enough for our team that, that it was a matter of trying to have a good time. We've felt watching England um, under your leadership since the World Cup in Australia, so for this past year, and obviously particularly it focuses in the 2020 World Cup, but also in other short-form matches, that you, you might have sort of felt a bit of the stardust that Brendan had sprinkled on the game. I, is that fair? Oh, I think it is fair. Um, everybody here will commend Brendan for what he's done not only for the spirit of the game, but in the manner in which they've played it. And it's a big factor. I, I hold it in, in huge regard in the future of English cricket. I think it's um, quite adamant the way we play has to appeal to everybody who's watching us. We have to inspire and, and take on role model attitude that, you know what, the spirit of the game is very important. It's not just about winning and losing. We spend so many hours in the net putting in hard work that when we go out and play and take the field, we want to be as freed up as possible. And over the last 12 months, we've, we've managed to achieve that in a very small way. Um, the challenge is pushing that over the next three years towards a World Cup. There's one thing I just wanted to pick you up on, on, on your point about mental freedom. 
and specifically uh, the day's play after you had met with Andy Pycroft and the two Australian umpires, and then you were told you had to go ahead. And then your team released, under the guidance of the uh, sports um, psychoanalyst you'd, you'd sought, whose guidance you'd sought. Um, did, did you, did you um, specifically say to the guys, I don't think we should celebrate wickets? I, in, in other words, I don't think we should make a show of ourselves or our performance. Or was that something that just happened? Yeah, it's a really good question. I've been asked it quite a lot. Um, for us, it was we, we didn't have any of those conversations. We never spoke about cricket. For us, it was just stay around your teammates, look after one another, look after yourself, um, and just do what feels right. And it just it just happened. Like we didn't wear black caps either, and like, we're incredibly proud of representing the black cap. But it just didn't feel right at the time. Um, we didn't celebrate wickets. We didn't bowl bounces. We didn't do any of that, and it was. It was just authentic. It just unfolded as things happen. And, and in the end, it was the only way we could get through the day and get through the days which followed that as well, was just by sticking together and, and trying to look after one another. And everything was natural, right? Yeah, not, was not instructed. It's, a, it's an interesting point. You, um, when you spoke to us a couple of years ago, you talked a lot about um, your small island and the great pride um, that there is in cricket and in cricketers. Um, do you think that the smaller the island, the smaller the cricketing base, the more sort of nationalistic your pride becomes? Or do you think that, it, that anybody's pride is as big as anybody else? Or do you fight harder for that little island? I always think, as like Brendan said before, and I also am a strong believer in the fact that you're motivated by various reasons to play. Um, sometimes it's to do with things that people might term petty or cheap, uh, fame, money, whatever. Others are motivated by maybe slightly more grand ideals. But the whole point is to be able to recognize why you do what you do. And when you play a team sport like cricket that has a fanatical following in Sri Lanka, it actually goes beyond just playing a sport. And the circumstances in which we found ourselves as a cricket team the social changes that we saw, uh, the, the horrors of war, all of that impacts upon the so-called pride, the feeling that you have when you walk out into the field wearing your national cap and your national colors. And for, for us, being 15, and a different 15 in terms of religion, race, ethnicity, to be able to unite together to actually play for our country and to chase a victory, irrespective of all these so-called perceived difference, differences. That was what I think motivated us the most. Mm -hmm. And once in a while, you lose sight of it. But I think, you know, you finish playing the game, and you go home, and you sit with your family. And then I think, if you've lost your way, that's when you find your way again. Because when you're surrounded by people that love you uh, without judgment, you also look at yourself in a very realistic and very honest manner. And I think for us, it was always the case. Play your cricket on the field, appreciate how lucky you are in life outside the field. And at the end of the day, for us, cricket was a sport, but our role as cricketers was more to, to bring a country together and to heal. Um, right, well, let, let's, a lot of talk about the structure of the game now. Um, hints that a two-tier test match championship is, is, is upon us. Um, firstly, do you think, Owen, that, that 50 over cricket and 20 over cricket have a place together in the international calendar alongside the test match game? Yeah, I do. And I actually feel quite strongly about it. I think in a world where T20 has become quite dominant and it's not just internationally it's it's actually domestic competitions that are that are almost formulating a, a new industry themselves I think it's very important that all three formats work side by side in order to uh, not prolong any one format but to almost encourage and open avenues where they're needed I'll give you an example the first two test matches of this recent series against Sri Lanka the attendance is one probably as we're used to. We're very fortunate in this country where people will come, rain, wind, the snow, they'll come and watch cricket. This year it's been a little bit different so far. And I think there could be an avenue whereby 
if we did have our own city-based tournament, the revenues from that can almost dovetail test match attendances. I don't see any reason why they couldn't subsidize ticket prices. So ticket prices don't have to be the same. We know who we're going to play against, not by chance, but by reputation, we probably will have a lower attendance in that series. So we subsidize tickets. We want more and more people coming to test matches. And I think that's the role I see sort of sitting side by side. And I think T20 cricket plays a big role in that. So they're three separate veins going into the same artery. Are you uh, up for a, a two-tier system in Test match cricket, or do you lean more towards a World Test Championship or a different idea? Uh, yeah, look, I'm not overly well read on it, to be honest. I think um, from our point of view, New Zealand would probably sit in that second tier, and to miss the opportunity to play the best teams in the world consistently and test yourself to see where you're at um, it doesn't matter if you lose sometimes, but playing the best is, is great. And then it allows you to know where you need to be, and then it allows you to go away, work harder, and come back bigger and stronger so that you can then test them next time around. I don't, the two tests, let's see, let's see what happens, but I think test cricket's not in a bad state at the moment. Um, you mean the way the game is played, the exciting n nature of test match cricket now? Yeah, I think so. I mean, not every test match, obviously, but not every T20 and one-day game is exciting as well. You've got to take the rough with the smooth. And I think over the last few years, we've seen test cricket has actually been pretty strong. And um, maybe with the advent of uh, the pink ball test match, for instance, um, maybe that's enough to, to stimulate a, a bit more um, attendance in, in, uh, in test cricket. I don't know. We'll see what happens with, with the... How was the pink match. ball? Do you see the pink ball all right? Good story, actually, about that, because... Kane Williamson said to me that um, he couldn't see the seam at night time. I said, what do you mean you see the seam? I said, I spent my whole life not seeing the seam. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome to the rest of us. Um, but it was, I thought it was great. It was amazing. Um, the only thing that would, would probably change is, like, the pink ball is meant to allow cricket to be played at night time. It's not meant to alter how t test cricket's played. And we, it was probably just a fraction too much grass on the wicket because when the lights did come on, yeah. the ball went around a little bit more versus... Being but that's a different issue, isn't it? Uh, uh, how, how much grass should be on the pitch is not relevant to whether well. you could see the ball OK and, and, and whether the players reacted well to playing at night time. Yeah, and there's always too much grass on the wicket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yes, you, you're pro. I'm a massive you're fan. Pro. Huge fan. Test match cricket, how would you like to see it? Well, I would like to see all teams get better at playing test cricket. And, you know, you've got to play against the best to see where you are. And you can't, everyone talks about different solutions to, to a problem. I think, uh, you know, get, get scheduling right, make sure that the public also has a bit of a breather from, from all the cricket that's played around the world so that when a test match is played, uh, that they actually yearn to you know, yearn for the opportunity to come to a ground and watch a test match. Um, there are so many things you can do around a test match, make it more attractive to bring families and, and children to a test match, make sure the facilities, you know, actually... Four days? That. Four days per test? I think test cricket's been played over, well, after the timeless test, five days. Five days seems, seems really good because... Overrates? The, the, Don't you think the overrates are too slow? See, the best, best, best two I've ever been on in my life has been the 2014 tour to England. And the two test matches that I've enjoyed, or the two matches I've enjoyed more than any other match I've ever played has been those two test matches here at Lords and up at Headingley. And it was more nail biting and more exciting than any one day or T20 match I've ever played. So for me, you can have a test cricket, a test world championship, you can have over rates and all these problems but it's always going to be the case. There will always be a debate. There will always be someone saying there's a better way to do it. But it is not about you know, crying that test cricket is dying. Because I think players want to play test cricket. They want to play better test cricket. And if you do not compete against the best, I don't think you will get any better. But, but. <laughs> Okay, well, the crowd has spoken. Um, uh, what about techniques? Fascinating, changing techniques. The clearing of the left hip, the ability that players have to bat without fear. I mean, you 
honestly looked to me as if the idea that you might lose your wicket was irrelevant to your innings. Every time or just the last few? No, just generally, just generally, that the modern player and you and, and a lot of others, Kevin Peterson's another, who bat in a way that suggests that the loss... Of, we were bored up, a lot of us in this room, at all levels of the game, you protected your wicket at all costs. That doesn't seem to be the attitude of a lot of modern players, and you're a good example. Yeah, I was born with really good eyes and a shocking technique, so I sort of only had... <laughs> For me, it was kind of, it was either six or out. Um, I didn't necessarily have the technique to be able to withstand um, quality fast bowling or quality spin bowling over a long period of time. So it wasn't until I kind of just accepted that, tried to increase my, well, become better at my weaknesses, I guess, and shore up a little more of my defence. But it was more about concentrating on my skills and, and working on the things which I can do well, and which is put pressure on the bowler and try and be aggressive and, and try and play that sort of game. And, and once, I, once I let go of trying to become a different player and just accepted the player that I was, you know, I think my results started to increase. And I think we've seen that with different players all around the world, the Chris Gales, the Verinda Saywags, the David Warners. They go out there and they, they, the games that they play in T20 are not too dissimilar to how they play in yeah. test cricket because I think they've accepted that that is what is right for them rather than chasing, we call it chasing the unicorn, and that's the perfect technique because it doesn't exist. But, but if you were the best example of adventure and he is the best modern example of something close to the perfect technique, if not the perfect technique, <laughs> then you are a good example of somebody... In... <laughs> I don't know what's coming, but it's not going to be good. <laughs> of somebody in the middle who had a natural way of playing that brought you success in the one-day game. Then you got into the test side and tried to adapt for test match cricket, which meant limiting yourself. Do you regret that, or, or, or do you think it's something you could have, with more time, improved upon? Uh, yeah, I've no doubt. I'd, I, I would have improved, obviously, with more experience and matches under my belt. But I, I, I tend to have to agree with Brendan on this one. I was a similar instance, and it's probably only happened over the last couple of years. I've, I've changed my technique so much probably after, for the last six or seven years. And up until about two years ago, I just accepted who I was as a player. And, and it, it's important not to forget actually what your strengths are. You, know, you can only manage your weaknesses only to such a degree where your strengths have to take over. And trying to get myself in as best position as possible, I think, has contributed to that. So, but that's come with experience. And well, Sri Lankans taught well. I mean, I'm trying to think, you think of guys like Roy Dias and Siddharth Wetamuni as against, say, Dulip Mendis and Arjuna, who are more unorthodox. Then you think of Aravinda, um, pretty orthodox. Um, there's a real mixture comes out of Sri Lanka. Is that the teaching or is it the fact that there isn't much teaching and everybody's just who they are? No, I think there's a lot of coaching in, in Sri Lanka. You, a lot of children now start when they're like six or seven, and they're very technical, the coaches that actually take care of these, these children, which is sometimes unfortunate because I always look at people like Sanath, Mendes, Murali, even Aravinda at times, and think, isn't it wonderful to have people who have maybe escaped formalized coaching at a very young age so that they have have something so unique and wonderful that people love to watch them play they're absolute match winners, Blasit Malinga, for example. Uh, and I love having these guys in a team because they're the, the difference, the X factor that, that brings you so many wins. Um, it, it, it's a strange mixture in, 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 in Sri Lanka. And one of the other things probably that goes in our favor when producing unorthodox players is that maybe we don't have such a formalized first class structure. We have a, a very good school structure. But once in a while, you get players who've escaped that school coaching, coaching structure, just fallen into first-class cricket, or suddenly turned up at the nets because some guy's written a letter saying, this guy's a good bowler. And he comes over and starts bowling. And suddenly, two years later, he's playing in the national side. Lasit Malinga was a, was a great example. I remember the first time he turned up, uh, he's, either he bowled a yorker or a bouncer. <laughs> and after facing three balls, every batsman in the side said, thank you. I think you should go to the other net. <laughs> <laughs> so Lasit kept getting shifted until we ran out of nets and he just stood on the sidelines because no one wanted to face him. And again, two years later, he was playing for us and now you know, he's, he's become the best uh, you know, one-day and T20 death bowler and 
maybe one of the most effective, you know, short form bowlers for Sri Lanka. So it's 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 a funny system, but it's very interesting how you know you talk about technique. At the end of the day, you're going to get out at some point. And if you're a batsman, if you score enough runs before you do get out, then I think that's the way to go. Very good. Very good. Um, the, now, from Twitter, um, at home of cricket, so that's us at Kumasar, at, um, right, I, I can't see who this is, from. oh, Elliot Evans, got it, Elliot Evans, if you're out there, this is you, um, what's the worst or funniest way that you've ever got out? Um, we'll start with you, Owen. Worst or funniest? Worst or funniest? <laughs> I played my debut for Ireland at Eton College against the um, CCC, cricket, uh, club cricket conference. And I opened the batting. And I roomed with a guy who had been dropped for that game. And he was sort of sleeping when I was putting my pads on. And didn't, he didn't look like he was going very far very soon. And I got run out without facing a ball. I walked off, sat down, put my pads on. <clears throat> He's raced out, sat down beside me, and he goes, what number are you batting? <laughs> <laughs> It broke my heart. <laughs> uh. Good man. Uh, I was batting in a one-day game at Ketha Raman Delights. Hot and humid. We're putting on a partnership with our last recognized batsman, chasing a total of 315. And I thought I'd be smart because I'll bat two and a half feet outside the crease or thereabouts. I just asked for a change of gloves the previous over, and as usual, as most 12th men and reserves are, they're watching TV, watching the crowd, and forgot to look at me, so they were in over late. And I was bowled a full toss, swung at it, the bat slipped out of my hand, went above my head, fell onto my stumps. <laughs> <laughs> I was out, hit wicket. <laughs> and I was thinking, what an idiot. If you'd stayed in your crease, it would have gone behind the wicket, so that's, that's, that's my story. All right. it's, it's on YouTube, so you can all watch it. <laughs> uh, mine was the other day at the ground called Merchant Taylors, and I thought South Dunedin was cold. Oh, it was that cold, that ground. And uh, I was batting, and I hit my first, well, hit about my fourth ball for six, and then the next ball, I've gone to swing pretty much exactly the same shot, and the bats come out of my hand, Morgs was there, come out of my hand and it's gone over, it's just about cleaned up the wicket keeper and then it's gone over and over just where, third, uh, where the short third man is, it's gone straight up court. So, but the worst thing, well that was, that was embarrassing enough, but then the change room's over the other side and the third man guy didn't even bother coming and picking my bat up, so I had to walk all the way over there <laughs> while they were all in a huddle, pick my bat up, then walk all the way back past them. <laughs> And then out and into the, um, what do you call that thing where we were getting changed? A tent. That was a tent, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Six and out. Six and out. Oh, well, I'm going to tell you mine just for the sake of it. Stump, best, oh, bold boycott. <laughs> <laughs> Stump down the leg side, last ball will function in a, in a Nat West match, and not out 35, and I work with boycott, and not a day goes by. <laughs> um... um Kumar, right, uh, actually this is a nice, this might be a nice way to, to, uh, to close things down. I, I, uh, the question is, is from Kumar, is that from, I suppose it's from Kumar, to Kumar, but it's to all of us. Uh, what's been the most satisfying change that you've seen in any aspect of the game over the past few years? Now, it may be that you've already answered that for us this evening, so I'm going to leave you for a second in case Beautiful. there's something you'd like to add. The most satisfying change to cricket in, it says the last few years, but let's say in your time. Oh, that's a tough one. I think what I've seen is that a lot more players around the world actually take the responsibility of playing the game very seriously. Um, gone are the days where you, know, you only talk about all the days play, have a beer and talk and chit chat. A lot of people actually now when talking to each other or talking to youngsters or talking to people actually talk about the game, the way it should be played, how we played, attitudes. Uh, and you can see a huge softening, not 
in the way they play their cricket. They play, most all teams play very, very hard. But I think you see a softening in that earlier hardness that you saw, the individuals, the personalities, where the connect with the public, or the connect with the fan, and the connect with the game is a lot stronger now um, than, it, than it might have been in, in the past. And I hope that it gets stronger in the future because I think everyone's talking about test cricket and spectators and all of this because at the end of the day, if no one watches us, no one feels that connection and no one comes to watch the game, cricket and cricketers both will become a thing of the past. Mm. I love that. Uh, Owen? Um, I'd probably have to say the, the general levels of fitness, both in international cricket and domestic. I think there's always a huge amount of talk about how big the bats are and how significantly that they've changed the course of not only the, the scores that we're posting, but they've changed the game of cricket, almost cricket slash baseball. And I couldn't disagree more. Yes, the bats are changing, but so is everything about the game. And the, the most significant one for me since I've turned professional at 16 to I'm 29 now um, has been the general levels of fitness. Guys are, are turning up and they are serious athletes as opposed to just something that you do after your batting, fielding and bowling. So that's, that's, a, yeah, that's a hugely significant thing, I think. Well, that's why I retired, because... <laughs> yeah, that's a... I've, got a, I've got, actually, we've just got, I've got time. I, I, want, I, I want one more um, feature, if you like, uh, from each of you about your own country. Um, I'd like to, um, to, to ask Kuma about this Sri Lankan side. who had such a difficult time on one very difficult pitch at Headingley that, that England bowled. I mean, James Anderson in the last month has bowled as well in that style of bowling as I've seen anybody bowl in my whole life, including, you know, Marshall and, 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 and all those guys. He, he's bowled close to perfect now, I, I would argue. Um, so it's been difficult for the guys. Just very briefly, um, Sri Lanka's future, these young players, uh, um, tell us. Well, it's lots been said over the last two test matches uh, in Sri Lanka and here, and talking about two-tier test matches and giving the two Sri Lankan tests as an example why Sri Lanka may not, have, not need to be in that top tier. Um, some reporters at home um, writing, well, what's this side doing here? To me, I think the players on this tour are the best players that we have in Sri Lanka. And just because they've lost two test matches doesn't make them bad players. Um, this is also the first step, in my view, of a process that will take us a year and a year and a half to really build a side that believes in themselves and in each other and actually plays the brand of cricket that Sri Lanka is known for. It's not going to happen at Lords or maybe not in the next six months. But what I admire about these boys is that having gone through all of that, faced all of that, they put up a great show in that last innings at Durham. Um, and also, I know for a fact, having played with some of these guys for a while and looking at the new players, that without a doubt, that they are the best suited to take Sri Lankan cricket forward. And no matter what anyone says, my, my belief in, in, in the players that we have out there representing Sri Lanka is extremely strong and I will back them 100% to take Sri Lanka where they, where they have to go. So let's have, a, have this chat again in a year and a half. <laughs> Very good. Um, I mean, with, with, with the, I would argue, probably, I, I'd need to research a bit, but with the four, perhaps the four most devastating and important consecutive strikes of a cricket ball, Carlos Brathwaite took away um, the World 2020 Trophy, a tournament that um, you had graced, your team had graced, um, as indeed had they. Uh, is, it, are moments like that things you learn from, or is that a bit of a myth of sport? Do you, do you regroup easily? Do you look back with any regrets? Would you do anything different? Can you give us just a minute or two on, on the moment and, and your thoughts in the Yeah, team? absolutely. I, I still, <laughs> still have nightmares about it. So. <laughs> no. Here, I think the thing that has to be said about the group of players that we have at the moment, uh, over the last 12 months, they've shown a huge amount of character. 
that culminated in the in the T20 World Cup final. We we scored an an average score on that wicket. It was a really good batting track, and to have the West Indies four down for I think it was 40 really early on with the most dangerous men back in the sheds. I thought we were outstanding in getting to that position. Coming into the 20th over of the game, if you'd asked me if I thought I was going to win the game, I would have put my house on it. Um, ben Stokes had been outstanding right up until then, and he probably only bowled one ball, one bad ball, I should say, which was the first one. The next three he bowled actually weren't that bad of deliveries, and I've re-watched them and watched them and watched them, not out of pleasure, <laughs> but no. just to learn... If we can learn anything from, from that, that will hold us in good stead in the Champions Trophy in 2017 or 2019 World Cup final. We want to learn as much as we can. So I think I'm incredibly proud of what we've achieved so far. I firmly believe that this is just the beginning of what I'm hoping is something special. I firmly believe that we have the players to achieve something special. And like any other side, gearing towards a World Cup. You want to build confidence and belief within the side, and certainly we've done that so far. Great. And Ben seems well. and I mean, I know he's injured right now, but he seems to have got over it. And he is, on. absolutely. I mean, he's, he's, he's quite a realist. We've, we've chatted about it. We chatted about it immediately after. Um, and we've celebrated some great times together as a side. Ben has individually won us a lot of cricket games, both yeah. with bad, on, bad and ball. And he's quite honest and open about it, yeah. Carlos, oh, if you're out there, they were good shots. Um, and finally, the impact of rugby in New Zealand is well known. Um, cricket has always fought for centre stage, and at times of late, under your leadership, has found centre stage, famously in the World Cup that didn't go your way in the final. Um, is that the norm now going forward, that New Zealand cricket has the chance to, to share some of that stage? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I Cricket in New Zealand will never be what rugby in New Zealand is. Um, rugby, we're all brought up wanting to be All Blacks. That's, that's just the way our culture is. Everyone wants to be an All Black from the day that they, that they uh, can stand up. And um, The thing we worked out, I guess, is that you can't compete against that. You can't look at the All Blacks and say, right, what can we do with what that the All Blacks do and try and bring that into our culture? because they're a completely different organisation. They've got a winning percentage of 91, 92%. Their playing numbers versus our playing numbers are extremely vast. Um, and rugby is a deeply ingrained culture in New Zealand. What we can do, though, is we can jump in the slipstream of what they've been able to achieve and cherry pick a couple of the key things which are fundamental to us and our success as well. And I think we've been able to do that over the last little while. And some of those traits that I discussed before, the uh, the hard, uh, hard-working, humble, blue-collar nature of, um, of how we went about reorganising our team is what the All Blacks are actually fundamentally um, known for. Even though they're, they're so successful, um, Richie McCaw is the last person out of the dressing room, the All Black captain. He's the one that cleans up, makes sure that the, that, that uh, change room is completely spotless. Their respect is phenomenal. Um, they play for one another um, and they, they personify the traits of New Zealand. We can take some aspects of that, but we'll never be the All Blacks. I think what is interesting as well is where, as, we're, as you were alluding to before, the synergy between England at the moment, Sri Lanka at the moment, and where New Zealand are. I think at times we've all been in the same positions. It was only a couple of years ago when Morgs and I were talking, and I'd just been through a tough time. The New Zealand team had been through an incredibly tough time, and then rolled into Morgs when he took over the captaincy. They went through a tough time. And where Sri Lanka is at the moment, they're going through a tough time. But it doesn't last forever, and I think that's where people need to realise that it's a long race. You need to trust in people, you need to support people, even though it's not the halcyon days, and you need to actually allow them the time and the effort to be able to, and the space to develop a team and a culture and judge them down the track. I don't think it's fair to judge a Sri Lankan team at the moment. I don't think that in the past it's been fair to judge some of the other teams, but over time they, they turn into something, and I think that's what Morgs has done with, New, uh, with England, and that's what Kane will do with, uh, with New Zealand, and I'm sure Sri Lanka in time, the same will happen. Okay, um, thank you. Um, yes? On that subject, could I ask one quick question of, of, of Brendan? Uh, in President's opening address... Yes, you can, sir, so yeah. 
No, but we should have. <laughs> this may offend slightly, but I don't think we should have a referendum for the flag, though. He should have just changed it, the Prime Minister. <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful flag, the one they proposed. Um, the black cap name is... Oh, it's commercial, but it is what it is now. I think, ultimately, we, we are proud of being New Zealanders, and we refer to ourselves as the New Zealand cricket team. Um, the All Blacks is a different different beast altogether. Um, they're known around the world as the All Blacks. For us, we're known around the world as the New Zealand cricket team, and I guess now it's nice to be known versus perhaps where we were a few years ago. I assume it's political correctness like the Springboks, so no longer <laughs> No, just, just a name, wasn't it? Just a name, yeah. Just a, just a name, I think. Yeah, I think it was just a name. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, no more questions from the floor, if that's, if that's okay. Um, <laughs> We, um, we've, all, we've all got dinner to go to somewhere. Um, what we ought to say is that um, uh, this year alone, 300,000 children um, through Chance to Shine will, will be delivered the Spirit of Cricket message. So uh, the, the nursery grounding, if you like, is there and continues apace as it has for a very long time. The ninth consecutive year, indeed, that MCC have worked with Chance to Shine and the spreading of that gospel. Um, uh, we had a fantastic day here, 600 children representing Chance to Shine schools all over the country. We're here 10 days ago. Um, uh, Roger was here and, and Derek and I hosted a fun event with these kids getting the chance to, to be here at this great place and to walk the hallowed turf and then to play on it afterwards and, and have a bit of fun. And, and their enthusiasm for cricket um, was very evident and actually very interesting uh, and, and exciting. A lot of the, the women's team were here. Charlotte Edwards was here, amongst others. Um, we've also launched a competition. MCC and Chance to Shine launched a competition of shirts for the best cricket teacher in England and Wales, which is a good thing. And interestingly, this is led in support by, I'm told to say, by Phil Tuff, Tufnell. Um, we've been very honoured this evening. Um, but um, before I say goodbye, we have an even more special honour because um, Brendan has today been made a life, an honorary life member of MCC. Uh, and um, <laughs> Roger, and Roger is going to present him with his tie. Well done, Roger. The president presents Thank the new man. Thank you. You've got to hold it. You may not wear it very often. Thank you. In in Owen Morgan, we have a great, great, uh, not great, I mean, a, 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 t a very talented leader and batsman. And I feel that our, our one-day game is in excellent hands. I really do. A beautiful talker. In Kumar Sangakara, we, we have now, I think, we must put him in the pantheon, uh, along with any of the great, truly great players that have batted in cricket. Um, I meant to ask him about wicket-keeping batting. We can't do everything. Um, it, right in the pantheon, in, in, in the Tendulkar, Lara, Ponting, Richards, um, Sobers pantheon of batting. Um, and in you, sir, tonight we've been challenged, we've been surprised, we've been entertained, we've been educated, uh, we've been stimulated, um, uh, and, and we've, we've found a side to cricket and, and its integrity and its dignity that we hadn't been fearful of, but we now can feel very confident of the sort of hands that it's in. Congratulations on a really special performance in front of us tonight. To all three of you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.